Hello, my name is Mark Thompson and I'm the Executive Director of the Newport Restoration Foundation. Thank you for joining us for this second annual Collective Perspectives. This week's discussion is part of our ongoing effort to share the story of our exceptional collection of 18th century Newport furniture. Our Collective Perspectives programming this year is made possible by a very generous gift from an anonymous donor. In truth, the donations from countless individuals and organizations interested in the material culture and history of the 18th century are what allow us to continue our ongoing work at Whitehorn House. So if you're enjoying this program, I ask that you consider making a donation to the Newport Restoration Foundation. You can visit the NRF website, newportrestoration.org, and click on the word support. A gift in any amount is genuinely appreciated. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to the Newport Restoration Foundation's second annual Collective Perspectives, a series of discussions about topics related to the work and collections of the Whitehorn House Museum. This year, we attempt to understand America's cyclical fascination with the material culture and personalities of 18th century America. In other words, what is the significance of and why do Americans continually return to the colonial revival or to colonial revivals? I'm Eric Greenberg, Director of Museums for the Newport Restoration Foundation, and it's my great pleasure to host and moderate these sessions, and I'm not I'm not exaggerating at all. Um, so let's begin our program in earnest. Um, as I've noted uh, in the title and description uh, of tonight's, tonight's discussion, this is an exploration of the colonial revival of the early 20th century, of the people who sold uh, antiques in that period, of those who created reproductions of those products, and of the consumers who purchased those items at the time. And I learned a great deal on these topics simply by reading the works of tonight's guests. Brian Greenfield is a public historian with a significant and diverse range of experience. Dr. Greenfield holds a PhD and MA in American Civilization from Brown University. He was a professor in the history department at Central Connecticut State University from 2002 to 2013, the executive director of the New Jersey Council for the Humanities from 2014 to 2018, followed by three years as the executive director of the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center in Hartford, Connecticut. And she was most recently named the director of the Division of Preservation and Access at the National Endowment for the Humanities. I was first referred to her by countless scholars really because of her exceptional 2009 publication, Out of the Attic, Inventing Antiques in 20th Century New England. Please note that Dr. Greenfield's uh, comments do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of the National Endowment for the Humanities, nor any department of the United States federal government. And I think it's safe to say that most of us are more interested in what Brianne has to say about colonial revivals, and far less than in, say, what the Department of Homeland Security has to say about colonial revivals. So welcome, Brianne Greenfield. Thanks for being here tonight. Thanks so much, Eric. <laughs> oh, it's a pleasure. And Erica Lohm is a somewhat newly minted PhD from the University of Delaware's History of American Civilization program. Let me say it one more time, congratulations on the doctorate. Thank you. Uh, she is the Perry and Jerry Curatorial Assistant at the Concord Museum, a position sponsored by our friends at the Decorative Arts Trust. And uh, prior to that position, she was a graduate curatorial fellow at the Winterthur Museum, Garden and Library. Dr. Loam has been a contributing writer to the Journal of Antiques and Collectibles since 2016. And like Brianne, I first learned about Erica via the rave reviews I received of her scholarship from a number of prominent academics in the field, particularly of her 2020 dissertation entitled Heirlooms of Tomorrow, Crafting and Consuming Colonial Revival Furniture, 1890 to 1945. Welcome, Erica Loam. Welcome, both of you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you for having us. Uh, yes, thank you for having us. Such a pleasure. Um, so we'll begin um, with something that I've sort of been thinking through um, over the past few weeks as I've met with people to prepare for tonight, um, which is with the periodization and naming 
as with all efforts of periodization uh, or sort of bounding studies, um, the boundaries of the colonial revival are in some sense fluid and contingent. Even to call it the colonial revival feels odd, right? Uh, and indeed, my own definition of the colonial revival for the purposes of this program have been pretty broad and freewheeling in an effort to bring together some really exciting scholars. And certainly compared to the way the term is typically used in the fields of decorative art and art history, right? So um, I'm wondering, perhaps for the sake of clar clarity, who knows, maybe maybe it'll be less clear, but I'm, I, somehow I doubt that. Can you explain to us the, uh, I'm sorry, can you um, give us each sort of your definition of that term or concept, colonial revival. And let's let's start with Brianne and then. Sure. And then. Happy to, I, I think it's a great first question. Um, and I'm just looking forward to hearing Erica's answer to it as well. Um, because I think that, you know, as you suggest, the, the colonial past and its, its uses are very mutable. Um, there's a lot of ways in which over time in different places that the colonial past has, has served um, different kinds of memory functions. But when I think of the colonial revival, I, I tend to put it in two buckets. One is a, a colonial revival with a, a capital C and a capital R, and the other it would be a, a lower case, <laughs> a more inclusive colonial revival. And when I think of that capital C, capital R period, I, I do periodize it um, to the late uh, sort of, 1880s through say the, the 1930s um, at a, as a time where so many different aspects of celebrating, turning to, reenacting, playing with the colonial past were uh, activated and, and coming together at the same time. And, and that was uh, of course collecting, uh, you know, reproduction furniture, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, engagement with people's genealogy and the creation of hereditary societies, museums, car traveling to see historic sites, uh, pageantry, reenacting historic events, uh, all of those kinds of pieces, you know, including, you know, I think such a, a confluence of engagement, um, you know, recreating, decorating it with colonial styles to dressing in period clothes. And I think that confluence of engagement is, is really particularly powerful and that it stems from a deep um, return or desire to engage with a colonial past that's in part um, comes out of an anti-immigrant uh, bias at the period, a period of nativism. You know, this is a period in the late 19th, early 20th century where you see a lot of transition from uh, a much more diverse population to much more greater industrialization. And the colonial past starts to provide a kind of nostalgic uh, place for a new kind of nationalism. And I think that we can talk more about the ways in which the colonial revival connects to a nationalism, but I think it's it's safe to say that it's a relatively different approach. You know, the historian Michael Kamen has talked about, you know, in the first hundred years in American history, the the idea of American being a new country as as providing a sense of shared or collective identity, um, and you know what you see in that late. Uh, 1880s period through the first decades of the 20th century is uh, a discovery of a past moment. And it's a very loose version of colonial, right? That goes, you know, includes colonial, includes early national, includes empire design-wise period um, that, that there's a new engagement with, an engagement with history as a source of inspiration. Um, and I think, you know, we can talk more again about nationalism and the way that that plays in the early 20th century with the introduction of modernism as a, at that time period too. But I think that that, you know, sense of a lot is going on in those mm -hmm. decades is a good right. place to start. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, this is this is the era, um, it's just high, right, the, the, calls the, the tribal 20s, right? And um, yeah, it's... 
it's quite it's quite an experience. It's quite a moment. It's it's the moment that I study as well. So it's. Uh, <laughs> One that's very interesting. And I love Erica's background, which speaks to so many of those things, right? You know, museum display and auto touring and, and right. decoration and design. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, so Erica, was... you're up. You, 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 oh, you boy. with me that you've been thinking about this, that I, I kind of gave you a, a comp question for, uh, for your exam, right? So was go for it, cite your sources and we'll, uh, this was actually one of my comp questions, I think, and ah. uh, maybe the hardest part of writing my dissertation. It, it's fascinating because colonial revival wasn't necessarily a term used during the period that we define as colonial revival. Obviously, colonial was invoked to refer to a style of architecture or furniture. Colonial, like Brian mentioned, sort of became a catch-all or a shorthand for certain values that were... Uh, seem to be American values, even though, of course, much of the colonial material culture that consumers and dealers and collectors idolize came from England, right? This was English colonial stuff that in the late 19th and early 20th century became part of uh, building a national culture. And like I said, these, these objects, their form, their material, their stylistic references came to symbolize for a large audience of people throughout America, came to symbolize taste, came to symbolize comfort, success, American success, and, and more than anything else, belonging. To, to have these things in museums, the culture of collecting and displaying antiques and preserving historic architecture, federal projects that promoted uh, tourism to historic battlefields and site, um, centennial and bicentennial parades to honor the landing of the Mayflower and the Battle of Lexington and Concord, all of that became part of both the national culture and then a sort of cultural nationalism, right? So these objects, and that's of course what we both focus on, really came to uh, symbolize a modern American way of living, which seems a little antithetical, but as this hour will take us through, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and when you think back to sort of the classical origins of the colonial revival. If you read Christopher Monkhouse, he'll say it begins with the establishment of the Massachusetts Historical Society in 1791. But in terms of what we might popularly recognize as colonial revival is really a post-Civil War phenomenon that really gained steam in the early 20th century. Right. Yeah, and I, just I wanna, think I just uh, wanted to, to, yeah. to, to underscore with, with you know, what Erica has said too, that there is, it's in the words of um, Tom Denenberg, myth and materiality, right? And I, and I think that, you know, the both of us uh, are very interested in, in the, the decorative arts um, ramifications and, and manifestations of the colonial revival. And I do think that's because the material piece of this is so important and, and, and so vibrant. Um, mm -hmm. and the way that it works with consumer culture that we both uh, are very interested in as well, which is so tied to those beginnings of the early 20th century too. Right, and which leads actually uh, perfectly into my uh, mm -hmm. question. Um, because it, so Brian, um, I mean, clearly having talked to both of you, you are fascinated with this moment in history, you're fascinated with the materiality of the things that you study. Um, but that point about consumerism and consumerist history uh, is particularly salient because in, 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 you know, in Kenneth Ames' review of your book, he praises the way in which it integrates market forces into the study of antiques in America. American antiques, Ames says, can't be separated from the marketplace. So can you explain to us the evolution of that marketplace, or, or, or to put it another way, how did antiques become um, an artistic commodity um, in America? How, how did that happen? And sure. maybe why wasn't it, wasn't it always that way, right? I assume some of us, when I started reading, to some extent, I assumed, well, this was just a thing that existed. 
but you assign like a creation to it. So I'd like to, if you could talk more about that, I'd really like to hear that. Sure. I, you know, I do think that it is so ingrained in us to think about, you know, old things as inherently valuable, right? As an inherently having um, uh, a monetary value. You know, we watch Antiques Roadshow. It's hard to get, it's hard to get away from the thinking, the thought that that is anything but natural and inevitable, right? But it really, it does have to be a cultural invention because the, the values associated, you know, with the, you know, I'm looking at all the beautiful pieces of furniture beh behind you in your backdrop and, <laughs> and thinking about their, you know, cash value. And that's, that is of course, a, you know, a, an invention of how much someone is willing to, to pay for it. Um, and, and my own book has looked at the, the development of the antique market in New England from the late 19th through the first half of the 20th century and the ways in which values have changed and what was subscribed to those material goods. Um, particularly looking at, at, you know, how old things, especially old furniture was valued in the, in, in the sort of the, again, 1880s, 1870s, um, largely from the associations that people gave to them, who owned it, where it came from, how it was used, not its aesthetic qualities, not what it looked like. Um, and the argument that I, I make is that there was a transformation from valuing things from as associational artifacts, who owned that, to how it looked um, and seeing it as an aesthetic object and therefore an art piece. And that there's a corresponding rise in the market um, when that shift happens. You know, what pieces go for for sale during that transition really transformed. And the, the antique dealer, one of the pioneer antique dealers, Israel Sack, um, once stated, he said, you can sell a story, but you don't get the good with the story. You can sell the good and then you get the story or something along those lines. But the idea being that if, you know, a story itself, um, you know, can, doesn't doesn't connect to it without connecting without being a thing. You can transfer the thing. You need to be able to value the object for its inherent qualities. And it, you know you can make up a story for any piece of furniture, but what the piece of furniture looks like is much more uh, marketable in a marketed commodity. And so you know I think I you know take the opportunity to show you just a quick couple of slides. Sure, if I'm, please. If I'm good at doing this, because this. Mm -hmm. Look good. It worked out. We'll we'll see how this shares. Here, let's try it now. All right. I think. Um, we were right. seeing your screen. And so let me let me show you. Um, this is. I think you're seeing there, um, uh, an inventory list from the antique dealer O. C. Hill, who was a an antique dealer in New Haven, Connecticut in 1902. And you can see the way that he was describing the piece in his own internal inventory, what it mattered to him. Um, and if you look here, it says a historical chair, one of the first six that the first minister that preached in Litchfield used as his best chairs. I mean, it's a pretty convoluted sort of, you know, piece. And, and you know, it it is, it is the kind of values that become ascribed to this piece versus uh, this later 1909 inventory where we get a huge uh, jump in price to $125 for this magnificent old sofa in mahogany, carved cloth feet, carved S-shaped ends, carved rim yeah. and back, black brass line inlaid on back, the best I have owned and ever seen. So. You know, with that, what you're looking at is both uh, a new attention to design instead of stories, as well as um, with that evaluation, right? There, that, that there's becomes um, a discrimination and you have entire industries of antique discrimination that it, are pops up. Um, particularly in the 1920s, you've got the founding of the magazine Antiques um, and its competitor, which folded during the depression, the antiquarian. 
um, that is starting to, to make these kinds of values. Mm -hmm. And it is particularly this way of, of describing things as art objects, which also then connects to a desire to know who the makers were, who the craftsmen mm -hmm. were, um, seeing behind you a lot of potential Goddard, uh, Tanzan and Goddard pieces, right. which itself was a, a invention that had to be discovered. The idea that these were craftsmen who should be seen as artists um, right. and that they were names to be known and investigated, that that is itself part of that invention of the industry um, that, that is a transformation that happens um, yeah. to describe new kinds of values. So. Right. By the way, on display at the Whitehorn House Museum, open Wednesday through Sunday, 10 to 4 p.m. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, as you were talking, I was thinking about that, that, that particularly that question about makers, right? Because today, and, and this was not in our questions, but you, you've got me thinking, and if you'll indulge me, I'd like to sort of pursue this a little bit, right? Which is, um, as somebody who's comparatively new to this field, I come from other museum fields and, and other forms of study, the thing that I continue to be taken with is the importance of the name, how central the name is. And especially with Townsend and Goddard where you have so many right, different people with the same name. So, I mean, how did that become, how did that become assigned with value? I mean, what, what, were, the, what were the choices? What were people doing to make that happen? You know, they were, it was a research project, right? I, you know, this is sort of the, in, the invention of the craftsmen as, as artists to go along with the, the aesthetic goods, um, mm. which certainly was in line with the way that fine art was, was seen, or, you know, I should say, um, you know, painting or, or sculpture or those kinds of, of, of arts that, you know, are beyond what we would put as the decorative arts. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, Duncan Fife was one of the early uh, sort of known name um, uh, craftsmen that was that was celebrated coming out of some of the work at the, the Met. Uh, and, you know, this sort of valuation and research into the provenance and the history of the pieces started to bring this idea of the craftsman to light. Um, mm -hmm. And specifically, as you said, very quickly connected that to uh, a market value. Uh, right. In part, and we can talk about this more too, um, you know, the idea of the, re the authentic and the real becomes an important piece if you're going right. to pay a lot of money for something that is a, that's a thing and not a story. Uh, but, you know, one of the ways that you authenticate uh, and you create, you know, what's, what's a real and what's value is about the maker. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah, and we've got so much more to talk about, but I, I want us to talk a little bit about Erica's work. Um, I, I um, you know, as you know, Erica, I did a graduate read of parts of your dissertation, which means the introduction and the conclusion. And uh, in the introduction, um, you say that colonial reproductions were among the most, and it's important to know, right, where the, this is the other question I had, right, is the authentic but there's also this whole other market. And I want to sort of understand that as well. Um, and Erica tells us that these reproductions of the pieces that Brianne was talking about just a minute ago were among the most successful commercial products and enduring cultural artifacts of the 20th century. I mean, it's an enormous claim, right? I mean, it's, it's an enormous claim. And, and so I, I want to know what you mean by that and how did it be or reverse them? How did this come to be? And what do you mean by that? However, you're sort of comfortable talking about this. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll begin by saying that you got to make a big claim when you're a doctoral student. Yes, but I think I, I think I can convincingly back it up, make a case for it. If you were to walk into any middle class home in the early to mid 20th century, you would encounter pretty much the same decor. I mean, you would encounter a Chippendale parlor suite or dining room suite. You would encounter the china cabinet with the lattice work and maybe a little federal uh, swag on top. You would encounter colonial revival furniture. 
even, they might be very nice high-end colonial revival pieces bench made by a reputable craftsman whose name became itself sort of the cachet. Uh, or you might purchase it from a department store and furniture made in Grand Rapids or Chicago found its way to Wanamaker's and B. Altman. And this furniture became ubiquitous. And what I mean by that is that no scholars really paid attention to it because it became so part of the background of middle class interior design style, right? We like to talk about arts and crafts and modernism. Uh, and very much those were, were uh, furnishings that you could find in um, wealthier or more uh, avant-garde domains. But if you were middling average family, whether you were an immigrant family, whether you were uh, a family descended from uh, colonial ancestors, you were likely to de decorate your house in much the same way. And that's what I mean by enduring, because this style, even though it sorts of, it sort of peaks among collectors and dealers in the 1920s and 30s, it has a long tail. And that tail carries straight through uh, World War II into the 60s and 70s and never really dies out. It transforms its meaning a little bit. So my dissertation came out of this question that I had. And this question arose because our family has inherited and has been carrying around since I was a baby and before that, my great grandmother's reproduction furniture. Uh, my great grandparents, Ethel and Max Cass, were Jewish Americans who lived on the Upper West Side in New York City. Uh, Max was an immigrant from Russia. Uh, Ethel was a second generation American. And they invested, their move from the Lower East Side to the Upper West Side came with a new suite of furniture. And what do they buy to symbolize their achievement, quote unquote, of the American dream? Colonial revival furniture, reproduction. <laughs> And these things were so precious in value, not just on a material level, but on a sentimental level. This was the, th these were the objects that we had our Passover seders on. These were the things that we had, uh, these were the, the scenery around our fond family memories. And so we had kept them and we held on to them. And it was always so curious to me, you know, as I'm thinking about issues of assimilation and belonging, why these sort of waspy things in a Jewish American home? Right, right, <laughs> right. I mean, there's a whole, there's reams written on, 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 right. on without sort of referring to material culture, there's still tons written on that as well. Um, but I guess, I mean, do you have any sense of how this happened, right? Because I mean, I, certainly do. I, I just remember it's worth noting, by the way, my mother is on the, the program as well now. So um, <laughs> I remember, you know, being dragged to furniture stores or to department stores. I, these things have no, they, they don't resonate with me in the way that they resonate with your family. And so, but I'm wondering if you can think about how this sort of played out more broadly in, in, in short, how this came to be. This is a really fascinating thing. And I think we'd like to understand the mechanics of it, you know? Sure thing. Well, let me share my screen so I can tell you a story. Okay. Well, the market for antique reproduction furniture went hand in hand with the market for antiques, right? Mm -hmm. Now, contrary to mythology, the Mayflower wasn't stuffed full of antique furniture and there was a scarcity at a certain point because everyone was collecting it. And so what do you do? You admire a piece in an auction catalog. You see a piece on view at the Met and you would hire a reputable cabinet maker to create a copy. Uh, and these were not fakes and forgeries. This was a legitimate and transparent and very actually culturally valuable product because to be able to commission a high-end piece of furniture uh, said a lot about you, your taste, your, your wealth and status. And the people who are sort of... Um, available to make furniture, sort of bench made high end furniture and imitation of colonial antiques were a lot of immigrants. Uh, so this is sort of a fascinating uh, parallel to my origin story. Um, so of course the high end things uh, sort of trickle down, right? So, you know, what are you, what, what's on view in your wealthiest neighbor's house? Well, I want a piece of that. And, uh, you know, cultural tastemakers and designers and the magazine editors take note, 
And especially magazine editors are helping to educate the average consumer. And by average consumer, Mrs. Consumer, I mean white middle-class women, right? In the, in the 1910s and 20s, there is a concerted effort to begin educating Mrs. Consumer about colonial styles of furniture because the consensus among these tastemakers is this is, <clears throat> this is the furniture of the new modern middle class. This is tasteful. It, is, it represents stability and comfort, and it's clean and sanitary, right? It's nothing like that Victorian stuff. This is, quote, modern. Right? So what you see here is, is efforts in magazines to educate consumers to identify shorthand style, right? You, if you were to walk into a department store, you would know <laughs> Chippendale by the cabriole leg or the pierced splat. You would know Hepple White by the shield. And in fact, I'm quoting verbatim from the trade journals who are saying Mrs. Consumer knows this sort of essence of historical style. She doesn't need an actual antique. In fact, women were, uh, middle-class consumers were encouraged not to buy antiques because what's worse than having a house full of modern furniture and one single antique little, you know, really exposes you. Uh, so instead, stay in your lane, buy really nice reproductions, and editors are in conversation with merchandisers who are in conversation with manufacturers in places like Grand Rapids who are identifying, again, these select elements of colonial furniture, and they're putting them together in ways that are very much improvised, very much based on what a large factory can manufacture in bulk, right? So you might have uh, specialty carvers doing detailed work for high-end things, <laughs> but more or less, you're going to have this chair here, which was one of the Baker Furniture Company's best-selling products it's in the Smithsonian. This is Colonial Revival. And I've seen this chair in episodes of Frasier. I've seen this chair in episodes of Dharma and Greg. So whenever, you know, the characters encounter the waspy in-laws, they right. have this piece of furniture. <laughs> and so magazine editors, once again, are instructing your middle-class homemaker to take inspiration from the American wing at the Met, which opens in 1924 and essentially establishes consumer <laughs> prototypes for the American home. This, and we can offer you here in these magazine editorials the names of manufacturers who can sell you these copies so you can have an American wing in your own home. And as you see, this really endures. These are, I typed in colonial bedroom, uh, looking up episode, uh, old issues of women's magazines. And I mean, it, it's, it stays the same for about 15 years, right? This doesn't <laughs> end. <laughs> And manufacturers get wise to this once more, and they begin creating their own merchandising displays, which they package alongside their furnitures to department stores. So essentially, you could walk into any B. Altman throughout the United States in Phoenix, Arizona, in Los Angeles, in New York, and you would encounter the same room over and over again. And this room, which you can see here, comes to represent tasteful American values, right? Yeah. This is middle class. This is what you should aspire to. Yeah. And so by the end, again, this is an advertisement for a gas company in Seattle. This is the image. This is the ubiquity I was talking about. It becomes so enduring as to become invisible. And that's how it happens. Fascinating. Fascinating. Um, yeah, that's, that's really, uh, really astonishing. It, and it, 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 it aligns really well with the work that uh, this Jeffrey Trask has done on on museums and, and the displays of right. period rooms and the ways in which these play out. It, it really, um, the two of you should really be, we, we, we need to get Jeffrey Trask on a panel. I've, and, I've and, read and, and devoured his book. <laughs> in, the, in the near future, we will have to, we will have to work on that. Um, now, having sort of explored um, the, um, the sort of narrative behind pieces, the way in which pieces become commodities. This isn't simply about acquisition, but right? eventually this is about ideology. And perhaps in, 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 in ways that some might find disturbing, right? So if you look at the related historiographies, it becomes pretty clear the colonial revival is more than a collecting craze. It's, a, it's an expression of nationalism at various moments in the history of the 20th century. 
Um, do you have any thoughts on this? Any any sort of examples? Any any things you'd like to discuss about the ways in which these these pieces that you know they are material pieces, and yet they stand for much much bigger challenging ideas. So, uh, Brianne, you want to start? Yeah, sure. I I think that you know. It, it's absolutely true. This is this is partly again the the, the moment in, in time in American history, right? You're also uh, at a moment of when uh, the United States is is moving on to the world stage, right? You know, the American century and the need to have a, a, a uniquely American art, and that I say that in big quotations because as as Erica has already said. You know the design, if not a lot of the pieces, uh, are actually British, right? But the search for something that is uniquely uh, America um, to be a, a touchstone at that moment of national expansion. Um, but you know, as I as I think about it, also, I want to build a little bit on what Erica was was saying about the connection to modern design too at that moment, because I think that there's something about the colonial revival, which is also, which is both past looking, but building the idea of a modern America at, at the same moment. And, and that's probably, you know, from that ideological standpoint is one of its incredible strengths that it can be both you know, um, imagining and build upon a past, a usable past narrative, but also paving a way, and I know Erica has much more to say about this too, um, but paving the way for a kind of a, a modern uh, identity conception too, you know, especially coming out of that Victorian period. And Erica's photos made me want to share um, an additional one, if I could. And if I move to, I think it was this one. Yeah. Um, you know, this, this here, uh, which as I said, Duncan Fife being one of the sort of early um, and very much sort of a celebrated American art craftsman associated with the colonial revival. But I just love this photo because it is so streamlined. I mean, the date is 1926, and it does look like it could almost, you know, be sitting next to, you know, a streamlined locomotive or automobile from the era. You know, that the, this is is building this idea of of modern consumerism, um, and and so clearly turning toward. Uh, a more machine aesthetic, very similar to as Erica was talking about the construction of craftsmanship at this time, making the leap from um, the individual craftsman or bench made work to mass production. And I think that this kind of idea, this kind of idea about consumption, and we'll switch that one, but, but this idea about consumption and, and modernity is really important in those early 20th century ideas um, that it's playing upon itself. And, you know, I, I guess, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit it there and, and let Erica speak a little bit before I start rambling about sort of other aspects of this, this modernity piece, but maybe I'll show one more slide before I do that to, to talk of a little bit about um, the ideas of consumption also that she brought up, which was, you know, engaging with the department stores is really fascinating for this period too, because, you know, the department stores, as she said, create this ubiquitous colonial aesthetic. But at the same time, the department stores were also in some cases dealing with antiques themselves. And I think that that is fascinating, that this idea of the antique was so incredibly powerful that you would break your natural supply chains and try to create a supply chain where you could go in a department store and buy something that was old. Um, and I think that that also helps to fuel, right? If you're in a, in a setting where the antique is so popular that the department store is stocking it, that the need and the jump for mass reproductions is so incredibly clear. And as Erica showed, some of those are this looking very much to the, the museums, uh, especially the Met at the time and the aesthetics of the 
displays the department stores are setting up. Um, and here, you know, in this one, which is the the in the pine room of our little colonial house. I mean, this is this is a period. This is a real period yeah. room in a department store. And so, as we think about nationalism and ideology, I just I first want to go to some of the ideas about consumption that this is is also enabling from the perspective that it's it's kind of a good American consumption, right? That right. It's, it that it's it's wrapped in values of patriotism and, and nationalism in its expression. Right. And as as Elizabeth Cohen tells us, right, the the one of the things that consumer society does is it makes it possible for uh, people of very different classes to own the same kind of thing, right? You can you can own a break front, one is an antique, one is a reproduction, but you both own that break, right? right? So um, there is certainly that I, I, ethic of shared identity, yeah. Right, right. But but you know what I'm I'm perhaps trying to get at something a little more arch, a little more uh, sort of Gramscian, right? Which is that this is very much, you know, in Trask's book, right, where it talks about this is an effort to teach people what they're supposed to buy to teach. Right. Jews and Italians and Slavs and Poles, this is the furniture you buy, not that Victorian stuff with all the twirls and the this and the that, right? Um, so Erica, do, I, I know you've sort of talked about this before. Yeah. You, would you like to sort of jump in? Sure. Well, I, I studied it from both sides, the prescriptive literature, right? Mm. As you're transitioning out of the Victorian era, there is a renewed, well, not renewed, but there is the colonial revival style becomes very easily mapped onto a new rhetoric of cleanliness and sanitation, which is a conversation being had directly targeted at immigrants who are living in these tenement apartments and are conspicuously consuming because why would they want to decorate in this sort of Puritan looking furniture that reminds them of the, of the old world, right? They, they're in America, they have cash. Let's fill your home with, with beautiful things that reflect your abundance, your newfound abundance. And so the prescriptive literature is trying to say, and here I'll, I'll share my screen a little bit to show, the prescriptive literature is, is, is warning, um, and of course I'll take my example uh, from, from the Jews, which I, <laughs> I'm always doing. Um, you know, for example, this is from the Tenement Museum, right? This is what a, a, a Jewish Yiddish speaking family's uh, home would have had, right? And you've got your beautiful Victorian couch there. It's, it's kind of wonderful and ridiculous. This is everything, right? The, the not only um, American Protestant tastemakers and scientists and rationalists and reformers were arguing against, but what's very interesting too is there's a tension within the immigrant community between those from an earlier generation who have assimilated, who are considered themselves assimilated, and American, un, uh, they are hyphenated Americans until World War I causes a lot of groups to lose that hyphenation, right? You're German American until you're just American. You're Jewish American until you're just American. And that's out of, of fear, right? Fear yeah. of, of discrimination. Uh, and so what's an interesting trend is that uh, German Jewish Americans, right, who are living in New York City and who are witnessing the encroachment of Russian Jewish immigrants into the Lower East Side, they're just as concerned because that, you know, while they have sort of protected themselves in this sort of secularized, Protestantized veneer, uh, it takes very little for that to turn, right? So they get involved in educating about what American style looks like, what it is to be an American. And you can see in this prescriptive literature, which is um, circulated from the like Jewish Federation of something to immigrants teaching them English, but you can see subliminally the backdrop of these lessons are what an American home should look like. Right. And there's your Queen Anne splat right there. So right. it's part of a larger sort of, it's all intertwined. What is American is colonial, what is modern is colonial. Uh, and, you know, I wouldn't say the efficacy of this, not everyone is like, yeah, I'm gonna go to Wanamaker's and buy my suite of furniture. 
some, you know, especially in enclaves, they're going to persist with the style that makes them happy. But you do see trends as people move upward the social ladder, uh, they start to adapt their interiors. This is, this is immigrant, non-immigrant, native born as well. It's less than that this style becomes associated with Americanism and nationalism and patriotism. It becomes associated with class. Right. And social status and that's why it persists right and domesticity and 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 that which is good right and yet in my discussion with both of you immigrants um are involved in every aspect of this work they are the consumers they are the producers they are the antique dealers um and and i know that both of you have have, have spoken about this at length and so i'd like to hear from both of you and so why don't we Brian? why don't we speak with you and then we'll go back to erica to talk about the role of immigrants in antiques and in revivals, uh, particularly in this first third of the 20th century. Sure, I think, you know, Erica and as our work buttresses together uh, incredibly well around this question of, of the immigrant as not just the consumer, but the tastemaker and the creator of this aesthetic in ways that I have to admit, when I started this research, caught me completely off sur by surprise. You know, I had no conception that the, that the immigrant played such a role in the construction of the antique value in, in, a, in the antique market. And particularly, you know, as I looked at um, the early antique centers, Boston, Providence, New York, around the years, 1900, 1910, I started to see over and over again uh, that it was the, the dealers in the area were very often of Jewish background. And this was really interesting, you know, and what I started to see was a, a kind of trajectory in which it was not unusual to see uh, a Jewish immigrant who had the training of being a cabinet maker. Um, uh, you know, this would have been, you know, in especially those who came um, from, you know, what what became Russia, but you know, from areas of Russia and Poland, and had early training in cabinet making, came to the United States, might have worked in a in a in a shop where they were doing repairs or doing bench production, and then discovering all these interesting odd people who kept coming in with old furniture uh, willing to pay high value high prices for old furniture and willing to also uh, have this work repaired and so many people so started to see Jewish immigrants who moved from being furniture craftsmen and repairers to recognizing that if they could find this stuff and sell it um, that this was, you know, a knowledge trade that they could make a really good business at. And, you know, Israel Stack is well known as, as you know, and his family is one of the preeminent antique firms of the 20th century. You know, Sack comes to, the, to Boston in, in 1903 and, and starts and working in a repair shop and starts to meet these folks who are some of the early collectors and starts to recognize that he can build a business finding these pieces. Um, I'll show you a couple of slides while we're at it, thinking about uh, antique dealers um, as these Jewish immigrants and how they, they made that transition. Um, this is the family, let me show you a couple images of, this is, um, Zeke and Nathan Liverant, um, Liver Nathan Liverant and Son Antiques. Here they are in the 1950s in a spread that was eventually published in Life Magazine. Uh, but here's Zeke and Nathan. Um, you know, Zeke started out as uh, really what they would call a, a picker, or uh, you know, he was he was scouring um, different. Uh, junk locations and started to recognize the ways in which, you know, higher values could be gotten for something that was called an antique. 
And here they are in what is still the liver in shop in Colchester, um, which is an old colonial church, which I think has some wonderful layers of, of you know, uh, taking appropriation. Um, and who's the player behind the, both the colonial the streetscape as well as the colonial goods. Um, and here's another picture. Uh, let's see. Here's another picture from that Life magazine spread, um, which is Zeke on an antique call. And you know, he, he, they they got a lot of the stereotypes um, of the the Jewish immigrant as you know uh, a, a money man or a deal maker or somehow shady. Uh, and that that was, you know, one of the reasons why I believe that they were excluded a lot from, you know, a number of the collecting clubs. Um, but it's absolutely true that they developed an eye and they developed a relationship with uh, many locals. Um, they did a lot of touring the country, you know, going out in the countryside, uh, knocking on doors, asking if anybody had any old furniture to sell and you know, becoming a network that brought that to market. And it was a very hierarchical network also about sort of what level of dealer you were, who you were connected to in terms of, of which collectors um, frequented your business and, and brought that work forward. I'll just show you one more piece from Deliverance. This is uh, a not, an announcement um, from 1930 of an auction. And you know you start to you see the tension in this. It's probably a little hard to see, but if you can read, if you read between furniture and antiques, they're making a distinct difference because they are selling all sorts of used goods, but they also are recognizing that there's a separate class that's called antiques, and that that's a class with a different value point. Um, and, and so that's, I think, a really, you know, interesting piece to see. And, you know, they are the ones who are, as I said, identifying, bringing it to market, establishing its value with dealers, museums, they're the supply point. And so the degree to which they are really uh, a force of the invention of Americana, I think is, is important to recognize. Right. And, and I know that Erica has looked at, you know, the vast range, I mean, immigrants from all over the place who are engaged in production and consumption. So Erica, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. Well, I think there's a, a point to be made about um, the sort of uh, preponderance of Jewish immigrants in this trade. And it's, it's not by accident, uh, you know, occupational patterns in migration, and you see it in the garment industry as well, Jews followed other Jews uh, into business, right? So in 99% of the cases of dealers and, and cabinet makers, they've got an uncle, a cousin, a brother already in America in the business. And so that's what you, that's why you know we see so many and what's fascinating and i'll read you a little statistic here if you go to the back issue of the first or if you go to the back of the first issue of antiques magazine in 1922 it lists all the little businesses in the city of boston and if you look at who is uh, offering reproduction furniture um all but two of them are immigrants right the following issue where they go to philadelphia Let's see, they've got 23 shops in the back of that issue in Philadelphia. So 23 shops in Philadelphia are offering their services as re making reproductions. Um, let's see, 17 were old, owned by immigrants, 11 of those were Russian Jews, and the remainder were Englishmen, Italians, and Germans, right? So immigrants, period, are sort of... right. They represent this field, uh, and why is that? Uh, as you know, after the Civil War, what happens is industrial furniture production takes hold in America. More and more youth are no longer training to become cabinet makers through an, a traditional apprenticeship. Instead, they're going to vocational schools like the North Bennett, Bennett Street School to learn how to become skilled operators of furniture making machinery. 
And the sort of division of labor in the furniture factory means that fewer and fewer native born Americans know how to make a piece from beginning to end all at the bench. Uh, that's no fault. That's just how things are changing. And for many Americans who go into the trade, they're making a great living. But it does leave this gap open, right? Especially at the high end. Who is going to make my beautiful Chippendale chair? Uh, I have a whole set that's just missing one. I need a copy for my Beacon Hill, you know, mansion. Well, I'm going to go to uh, Isaac Kaplan who's an Eastern European Jew in Cambridge and who specializes in this. Uh, and so they sort of gain a reputation. But what's fascinating here is that it's more than just Jews and their impact is more than just in the making of furniture. And I'll share my screen just to illustrate a couple of examples. So uh, in 1880, Olaf Altine, who is a Swedish craftsman comes to Boston. Uh, he's trained as a cabinet maker. He's able to set up shop uh, for himself in by South Bay. And he begins working primarily for two major collectors of American antiques, uh, Charles Hitchcock Tyler and Eugene Bowles. And deck arts nerds would recognize those names because Eugene Bowles, when he died, he donated his entire collection to the Met. And it is the core of their American decorative arts collection. Charles Hitchcock Tyler, when he passed away, his furniture went to the MFA Boston. Again, the nucleus of that American furniture collection. Right. From 1886 through Altine's retirement in 1915, they are his constant customers. And if you look through his book, he is repairing and restoring every single antique that they acquire. And so it's this interesting tension, right, between collector and cabinet maker. This is the Wild West, right? No one knows what an antique should look like. Very much, these collectors are making things up, right? Uh, you know, do we strip all the varnish off and get to the original wood? Do we paint over to what we think it looked like in 1735? Who knows? Altine did what he was told, but in doing so, he gained a mastery in American decorative arts. To the fact, to the point that, uh, you know, if you were to walk into the Met today, he laid his hands on nearly every piece of antique American furniture that came from the Bulls collection. Wow. It's amazing, right? This yeah. immigrant craftsman shaped the look of American heritage. And this is true, not just for Altine. The German, the German Pothouse brothers in Baltimore are doing the same thing with their clients. Nathan Margolis in Hartford begins as a repairman and a dealer. Uh, and the proximity to these wonderful collections means that they are able to take measurements and make sketches and drawings, and they're able to do this, right? And they're learning. So Brian mentioned Duncan Fife at the beginning. Well, Ernest Hagen, who was a German Jewish craftsman, was the main reason we know anything at all about Fife, because he did all the research into him. He was became so interested in reproducing Duncan Fife's furniture that he interviewed surviving family members, and his scholarship contributed to the Metropolitan Museum of Art's 1921 Duncan Fife show. Right. Wow. wow. Again, in Enrico Liberti, an Italian cabinet maker in Baltimore, uh, the uh, I think it's the State House in Annapolis, all of his reproductions are in there. So again, these, these immigrants, by virtue of their skill, by virtue of their talent and their connections to these worlds of elite collectors and dealers are able to really make uh, their mark in the colonial revival. Mm. Just uh, on, the, the connections are really, really extraordinary, right? It's one of the things that I'm still trying to completely get my head around. And um, I think uh, it, it's 8.07, so we really do need to open this up to questions. Um, but before we do, this is typically the time of night when those who don't have questions might head off. Let me just observe quickly that, uh, I mean, Erica, you just sort of, you served it up beautifully. Um, next week, Mickey Callahan of the Society of American Period Furniture Makers and Steve Brown, uh, who recently was an instructor at the North Bennett Street School in Boston, um, will be speaking. Um, these are two furniture makers who do this kind of work, and we're going to talk to them about their experiences and why they do this um, and other questions related to creation of, of these materials. So now we want to open it up to questions um, from the audience. And Caitlin's back with us. Hi, Caitlin. Um, have we seen any questions from, uh, from the crowd? 
Not yet. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Because if not, I'll maybe ask one more question and then we'll go home. So we'll give it a minute. All right. Well, then just quickly, you've been hinting at it throughout um, this idea of the modern, right? So in some sense, Brianne's demonstrated it to us with, you know, sort of modern being simple and sleek and but in some sense, I, I wonder if you can sort of tell us what you mean when you say modern, because to me, I mean, I actually, as somebody who studies intellectual history, right, it, it's not unusual to see really conservative movements uh, described as modern because they are a reaction to the modern, right? Oh, wait, we have a hand, George Goodwin. George, go ahead and type in the chat if you could. Um, I don't know if he's able to do that. Well, you know what? Let's give George a minute to talk here. Let's see if I can allow him in quickly. George, can you hear us? No? He's muted, I wonder. There, there I am. Okay, George, so what okay. I, I'm, I'm very much enjoy your, your learned uh, theses and arguments, but I want to take a detour and ask what is behind Dr. Greenfield's <laughs> uh, Okay. What is this montage? Excellent. We all, I'm wondering we all ask if anybody the same question, George. We all ask the same question. So I, I'm wondering if anyone from Rhode Island can recognize where this is alluding to. Well what is it? <laughs> It's a painting, uh, well, actually a collage that the artist Catherine uh, Veneman did uh, responding to a trip we took many years ago uh, to Smith Castle in Rhode Island. So you can see that she's pulled different things and reproduced them from the archives as well as thrown a bunch of glitter on it also too. Well, she didn't throw a bunch of glitter. She did it in a much more <laughs> artistic way, but it usually sits behind me on the wall. And I thought today I would bring it, bring it forward with its colonial revival spirit. <laughs> so thank and, you so much. Thank you, but what is its actual size? Um, you know, it's, let's see, I have to turn around and look at the actual size. Uh, it's like, uh, Five by four. Oh, wow. In in that's quite a piece. No, feet. Feet. Oh, terrific. Wow, that's quite a piece. Yeah. I enjoy it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, George. Yeah, great. So um, let me just quickly, and, and if we see any other questions, Caitlin, let me know. Um, you know, the, the, the very often conservative idea, conservative practices, in many senses, in some sense, or ultra-Orthodox Judaism, is a modern movement in the sense that it is a response to that which is modern. So I, I, I'm just wondering if you can speak a little bit more about why and how you see these things as modern. I mean, you, I think you've pointed throughout, but I think if you could, if, if, if you had to sort of do it in a couple of sentences, why is this movement that focuses on something in a deeper past a romanticized past at that, why and how is that modern? Uh, and, and I'll, I'll speak a little to that and, and then I'll let, let Erica uh, chime in as well. But, you know, I think the, the work of the historian Jackson Lears is, is, is very important sure. in this as well. It's, he's looked at the, specifically the ways in which a, a fascination with the past in kind of an arts and crafts sense, which certainly the colonial revival has as one strain within it around the turn of the century. Also, a desire to connect with uh, a, you know, a life that is more authentic, right? You know, right. more manly perhaps sometimes as well, uh, particularly at this moment of industrialization and, and a concern with, with uh, you know, becoming, uh, you know, over-civilized and, and the, the concerns about uh, nervousness, uh, you know, that 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 uh, rise at that time as well, and so this, you know, turn to the colonial past as a as a wellspring for a more th authentic life also connects to the emerging therapeutic culture of the right. time, 
And uh, yeah, so you're you're, you're so it's modern in the sense that it's anti-modern, right? It's it, it is a response to modernism through what Lears calls anti-modernism, right? Exactly. Exactly. Anticization of that which we sort of of, of, of elements of the past. Now, and that idea about individual self fulfillment that right, comes out right, with therapeutic right. with a therapeutic culture. You right. know, this is this is pieces of it, which you know is bound up in consumerism at the same time. Uh, absolutely. So therapeutic culture and consumerism. That's pretty. Pretty one and the same. Yeah. Right. You can't even go to therapy if you don't pay for it. So um, you go Erica, to therapy by going to the mall, right? right. <laughs> Erica, what are your thoughts? And then we're going to call it a night, I think. Sure. Um, what's interesting is that the the way that people people in the past in the early 20th century, the way they understood this movement, this ideology, this moment, wasn't a very modern. Uh, modern vocabulary, modern uh, ideologies mapped onto it. Uh, there was never any moment, I think, where people were actually saying, I want to go back to the 1600s or 1700s. Instead, they are selectively curating the past using very modern methods, right? The department store merchandising, right. the mass circulation of print advertising and, and periodicals, uh, the automobile which takes you from your Manhattan apartment to Vermont uh, into the past, as you know, the American guide would, would put it. Uh, and so the apparatus of the colonial revival movement is incredibly modern and progressive in the sense that this style of furniture uh, and architecture was considered to be modern by its makers and consumers. And I'll give you a little example here. Uh, there was a sort of memo going around in Grand Rapids. Herman Miller is complaining about this sort of obsession that the trade had with Chippendale, right? And he's like, Chippendale was modern for his day we have to find designers who are modern for our day. And the rebuttal is, and I'll, and I'll quote it because the PR guy for Grand Rapids is like, no, 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 no. This is our, this is the moneymaker here. And he's saying that they are furnishing quote, actual existing homes today with contemporary furniture, even if it is Chippendale or Louis says, right? Right, it right. Understood that by the very mechanism of designing, crafting, producing in batches large enough to feed every department store across the US, that the very um, process of taking this and this and this and putting it together to create a chair that they could call Chippendale, they knew it was modern and it reads as modern today to our sort of connoisseurial eye. So there, I don't think there is the schism here that critics you know, wanted to invent. <laughs> Right, and I, and I think also the, the, the modern factory too, right? I mean, which right. is part of this work. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Um, ladies, it, it, it's, it's been such a pleasure to spend time preparing for this with you, um, to spend this evening talking to you. I always learn a lot when I talk to either of you and um, it's really, really a great joy um, and I hope that we can continue these conversations in the years to come because the Whitehorn House Museum isn't going anywhere and we're going to, um, you know, we're going to want to think about interpretive work and programming um, that reflect, I think, sometimes ideas that you have raised tonight. Um, what you've shared with us is really, really important. I think it was a wonderful way to kick off um, the series. I'm, I'm deeply grateful that you joined us. I'm grateful that all of you uh, joined us tonight as well, all the visitors and guests who uh, joined us online. Thank you very much. Please remember that we're doing this again next week at seven o'clock with Mickey Callahan from the Society of American Period Furniture Makers, Steve Brown, formerly of the North Bennett Street School and friend of the Whitehorn House Museum. He just did a program for us a few weeks ago. Um, it's really been delightful. Thank you to everybody. Uh, most of you don't have to drive home, but if you do, here in New England, it, I think it's going to start raining, so be careful. Um, and everybody have a good night. Thanks once again. Thank, Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.